The companies that have transformed our lives, the companies that have shaped the tech world that we live in, all came out of this patch of land. Silicon Valley is this region south of San Francisco on a stretch of land called the San Francisco Bay Area. And in so many ways, this is the cradle of innovation. This is where Uber released. This is where YouTube started. Tens of thousands of years ago, when the glaciers melted at the end of the ice age, what these guys expect is that they have long fun. This is where Steve Jobs started Apple. Working in this garage, Jobs and a high school classmate quit their positions. Is it that one? Yeah, that's where Apple started. And it's also, in every sense of the word, a dystopia. Neighborhood where many felt the problems were spinning out going? of control. I didn't think it would, but it's actually gotten worse. And understanding why it is is really not immediately obvious. You have to understand decades of history back to the 60s. It's gonna be a first try giant Tesla. No keys? Just with. <laughs> you have to cut this from the video because I don't even know how to. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm here in the Bay Area this week to talk to founders, entrepreneurs, old friends to try and understand what went wrong, what's going wrong. The talent is here, the investors are here, the network is here. This is also an incredibly diverse city. 35% of the population were born outside of the US. It is truly a cradle for innovation with an incredible quality of life, forward-thinking policies, the highest salaries in the US and in the world. But owning a home is a dream reserved for a select few. The most expensive place the to rent, rent in to America. $8,000 a like, month. Had no idea it could be that much. $110,000, that's considered low income here. Tech workers are rejected by the locals because unless you work in tech as well, you can no longer afford to live in the neighborhood that you grew up in. RV streets are becoming a norm, and all of this has snowballed and continues to grow into this gridlock. 315 affordable apartments and rezoned it for 44 single family homes. The gridlock that its own citizens have created and the tech companies are only making worse. And finally, the homeless population in San Francisco has skyrocketed. And despite this state's economy being bigger than most countries, there's just no solution in sight. This is Startup Planet, Silicon Valley. I'm Guys, who's sponsoring the Silicon Valley video? Okay, I guess we'll do it. So if you think that YouTube pays for this whole setup and this whole team and all this stuff, we have a bunch of computers rendering here and, and, and a trip to Silicon Valley just to make a video, it doesn't. And the only reason why we can do that is because we stand at this really fun crossroads of our company actually doing stuff to help startups succeed. So I'll just spend 15 seconds telling you really quickly what we do at Slightbeat. We, again, we're not just a YouTube channel. We have a SaaS platform that helps founders navigate the whole process of starting a business. From creating the pitch deck, to running their financials, to finding investors. And we also have a team that can get involved, like hands-on, deep dive, help them tell better stories, help them figure out if they need to raise money, if they can raise money, how much money they need to raise, and how big their companies can become. We've been doing this now for 10 years, and YouTube is just the latest little marketing experience that we've come up with. Okay, back to the video. I honestly think that Silicon Valley begins on a very specific morning. That morning is the morning that the guys from Shockley don't know if Moist is going to go. As an engineer, would you say there's a cooler city to live in? Just the people that you're surrounded and what they are doing and just, you know, the experience that they have is so vast and it is so easy to find here that it's, you know, miles away from anywhere else. Like New York City still has a, like a tech scene, for example, but it's still smallish if you compare it to the Bay Area. An engineer like Fernando is likely making over $250,000 a year working for Google. And these jobs, they aren't really reserved for the elite. The Google campus where thousands of Google employees work is not only beautiful, it comes with free food and health clubs and courts and pitches for every sport that you can think of. Google essentially built this small city in Mountain View and they don't want their engineers to leave it. Free food and dietitians, personal trainers, massage therapists can literally bring your dog to work, no problems. Now the Google Plex sits right next to the Microsoft offices. Both are in Mountain View, which is one of over 10 cities that make up this stretch of land, Silicon Valley. Most of these aren't really cities the way you think about them but they're really like small suburbs around this central street. The largest city that's part of Silicon Valley is San Jose, with a population of about one million people. Holy shit. 
I didn't even check. Just trust the car to change lanes. That is Jimmy McGill's car, isn't it? This is clean. San Jose is actually the third richest city in the world by GDP per capita. It's the fifth most expensive housing market in the entire world. But to be honest, it doesn't feel like your traditional super rich city. The richest cities in the world are Oslo and Zurich. Third, this is the third San Jose. But does it feel like a, the third richest city in the world? No. But what you see around the Google and Facebook or Apple campuses is mostly suburbia. They're single family homes. And that's where the problem starts. That one, that, that one upstairs with the flowers. <laughs> Number 10. Okay, that's where we used to live when we when we used to work here. No no furniture, barely any lights. We, we it was it was a shitty place. I mean it was fun, but it was a shitty place to live. <laughs> <laughs> So we're driving to Oakland today. We're gonna to meet with Eric and, and his fiance AJ. Uh, Eric is an old friend of mine. We, we grew up as kids in Costa Rica and they just bought their first house in Oakland, which is on the other side of the Bay. Back when I lived here in the Bay Area, living in Oakland was uncool, but the area has experienced this incredible gentrification over the last few years. West Oakland is changing and some are redefining what community looks like. It's changing so quickly. Where, where am I? I've been here for 72 years. <laughs> How do you figure life in the Bay Area if you don't work in tech? So when I was at the restaurant, I was also at Compass, and so I had like no life at all. But if you were just working in the restaurant scene, or if you were doing a job that wasn't in tech, you can't like live in San Francisco. Like life would be really, really hard, or you'd have to live like outside of the Bay Area and basically commute in, which a lot of the people that I knew that were working at the restaurant were doing. So they were like living like 40, 50 minutes away from the city, but commuting in all the time. But for many people looking to live or work around San Francisco or Silicon Valley, there's really no other option, especially if they want to start family. I mean, I have friends that don't work in tech and one of them actually recently moved to San Francisco, realized that it wasn't really working out because he works at a, at a warehouse for like bicycle parts. Quickly realized he needed a second job, so had to, now is currently working probably around 12, 14 hours a day. Working in the morning at one job, having a break in between and then going to his night job just in order to pay rent that he's splitting with his like, girlfriend. It's, it's so crazy. It's really hard to find people who can live and work in that area. And I think a lot of those people are choosing to do something else. There's not a single aspect of living in California that's cheaper than any other state. Let's take, for example, gas prices. As of shooting this video, the national average for regular gas is $3.75, but the gas in California is 41% more expensive than the national average. Not even in New York, one of the most expensive cities to live in has gas coming close to that. Californians also pay a lot for electricity. To raise rates, 22%. You say it could convince them to leave the Golden State. 80% more expensive here than in other states on average. And here, other factors come into play. That's the topography of the state, the tendency to have wildfires are two of the reasons why electricity has skyrocketed as well. And as the state gets hotter and hotter, the AC demand increases, putting a toll on the already worn out electrical system. Ah, uh, we can't find the charger. The, the guy from Turo said that we shouldn't let the car go under 10% battery. No, 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 no. This is, this is the definition of first world problems. We've been driving around San Jose trying to find a charger for our Tesla. Ah, finally! <laughs> we almost crashed just coming here, but we made it. Finally, man, we were, we were out of battery and it was not easy to find it. But the biggest problem, the biggest driver of this high cost of living is housing. How much did you guys pay at that time for rent? For rent? Uh, -huh. uh man, rent was like 6,000 in this place. Even worse before that, we used to live in this, it was like this hacker house that had a shed in the back and they had sort of adopted that shed to be a bedroom. So they rented that out and all three of us co-founders slept there for maybe a month. I honestly don't think that slide bean would have survived if we would have stayed here in Mountain View. How about kids? Kids are expensive. If we have kids here, it's going to be expensive for sure and we're gonna have to make sacrifices. 
Public school in the U.S. works by district, and rent can differ vastly depending on how good that school district is. That happens a lot in New York City, for example, where you can have this big division between a school district that's really great and one that is not. And, and it really changes from one block to the other, and the rent can vary significantly. And you're basically paying that school through the rent. San Francisco works a little bit different, though. They have a unified district because they uh, believe that a neighborhood where people with lower income just go to that school, you have people with higher income in another district with another school, they actually mix them up. Stand up for your property rights before they get taken away. They want to take away your decision of where you're going to live and how you're going to live. Take a look around and what you'll see is very few skyscrapers in San Francisco. Most of San Francisco can have buildings taller than 40 feet and there's a reason for that. A reason that while on the outside might seem noble, is really a mix of good and bad, because in the 70s and 80s, many groups from environmentalists to affordable housing advocates pressured the local government to slow down the city's expansion. Some of them wanted to preserve history. Others wanted to safeguard parks and the views and guarantee sunlight. And others wanted to prevent gentrification by slowing down construction. In this way, there wouldn't be these quick spikes in rent or evictions, all the issues that come when the city expands so rapidly. So in short, they didn't want the city to become Manhattan. And they actually accomplished it through the years more and more policies made it harder to build vertical, which is usually the ideal way to build affordable living. And back then, the idea was pretty noble, but then you look at the situation with more detail. Sunset zoning is beautiful, but it is impossible to have tall buildings near parks. Residential areas can block tall building construction, which means that only the downtown area can really expand, and there's only so much space downtown to build on. And all of these restrictions worked in the end. They managed to slow down the influx of tall buildings in the city. But at the same time, the Bay Area was booming. As Silicon Valley became the world's tech hub, more and more people wanted, needed to live here. From 1980, when these activists pushed for strong regulation to 2020, the population in the Bay Area has increased by almost a million people. Meanwhile, the Bay Area has only built half of the housing needed to meet that supply. In a four-year gap, from 2012 to 2016, there were 373,000 new jobs, and the total amount of housing units built was 58,000. So these activists back then achieved their goals. They did it. And the thinking behind this reform was solid, to keep open spaces and sunlit parks around the city. In the Californian mindset, it made perfect sense to have these restrictions, but it backfired. And the housing situation in San Francisco is bad, but in the rest of the Bay Area, it's even worse. The majority of land is zoned for single family homes. If you're not from the States, a single family home is this a one or two story house in the middle of a plot. And these plots of land can't be split and you can't build, for example, a duplex for two families to share the same building. So with the insane demand, prices have, of course, skyrocketed. I can't afford rent. I can't afford to buy a home. You need to make at least $123 an hour. We are suffering from a chronic housing shortage. We were trying to look at these housing prices in Silicon Valley and we found this horrible place and it was truly selling for $1.2 million. And we checked it out and it's real. It was actually real. It's actually real. That house is listed for $1.3 million in Zillow. The city developers, they've tried to rezone parts of the Bay Area to take plots of land and zone them for apartments, for affordable apartments. But more often than not, they are met with outrage from their communities and their neighbors. We need housing everywhere. And we can't allow cities to just turn down perfectly good apartment projects just because they want empty fields or single family And homes. the reason why these initiatives get blocked seems to contradict everything that we understand about Californians. California is supposed to be the progressive state, isn't it? During World War II, the city became a haven for gay soldiers who had been discharged from the war in the Pacific. The city became a beacon of progressive thinking, not just on LGBT rights. They were the first state to legalize medical cannabis. Well, these affordable apartments, they are getting blocked out of selfishness. If affordable housing gets built, your plot of land that's been appreciating like crazy, that is worth millions of dollars because people are desperate to buy it, well, it doesn't appreciate anymore. The ludicrous imbalance in supply and demand gets balanced, but that means that the existing homes and plots of land are worth less. It might also mean neighbors who are not millionaires like you, and people don't want that. 
I'm a gentrifier. The city shouldn't just be a, a theme park for young upper middle class people. Like, I'm sure that there's someone who has it just a little bit harder uh, to find housing because I occupied this, this place that I'm overpaying for. More and more people work here and rent becomes more and more expensive. They just have to find other places to live. Areas such as Los Baños, Tracy, Leandro, Daly City, Pacifica, and Hayward are some of the cities that have become more popular with blue collar work. Los Baños is almost two hours away, but rent is finally manageable. And here you can find apartments ranging from $800 to $1,100, houses around $2,000, what you would pay for a studio apartment in San Francisco or Silicon Valley. Take an Amazon warehouse worker, for example. Amazon has a warehouse around here and they need to pay their employees. These people are the gears that make other Silicon Valley parts move, the ones that we take for granted. Services, deliveries, cleaning bathrooms. These blue collar workers who traveled two hours one way don't get to see the perks. They say housing costs are getting so high that they're getting pressed out of the city they've called home for decades. Living so far from Silicon Valley has other consequences that has impacted the lives of everybody in the Bay Area. And among them, we have super commuters. That's a term for anybody who takes more than 90 minutes to commute to their job. And in the Bay Area, this was a common occurrence only for a small percentage of the population. Now with everybody living so far away, getting to the Bay Area has become increasingly harder. Places such as Sacramento, San Joaquin, Santa Cruz have around 40% more super commuters than in 2007. And the closer you get to the main arteries of Silicon Valley, the more time you must must invest in travel. San Francisco has seen 110% more super commuters and Alameda 127%. Silicon Valley doubles the average number of super commuters in the US and there's again no solution in sight. It can be a technological marvel but Silicon Valley seriously lacks good public transportation. Even if more and more people drive into Silicon Valley, fewer people use public transport now than ever before. It's as though Silicon Valley is designed to resist public transportation. It's not one hub, it's a series of these smaller cities that are interconnected. And this means that citizens here don't have to deal with one or two agencies, but 27 different public transportation agencies. Light rail, heavy rail, bus, ferry, they're all independent and merging them is almost impossible. Riding public transportation is so difficult that historically only 12% of Silicon Valley's population uses it. We'll probably watch this and think like, why hasn't this guy driven a Tesla before? It's not a, it's not anything special anymore. But it is, man. Like people in the Bay Area take this stuff for granted. But it's not for granted. This is not a thing easy to find in the rest of the world where your Uber is a Tesla. Tech companies need the people. They need the talent, and they have the money. So they have taken matters into their own hands, for good or worse. Apple created a project called Apple Park Village in Cupertino. Salesforce Tower, the tallest building in the city, has space reserved for apartments, Adobe, HP, Intel. They're all using the billions of dollars at their disposal to build more housing. But there's a catch. These houses are mostly for their own employees. Facebook is cooking up a big new project to expand its Menlo Park campus into what can only be described as a fully-fledged town. And the entirety of its construction has been built around the well-being of the people that make the company tick. Perhaps the most controversial of all of these projects is Willow Village, a massive 60-acre mini city complete with grocery stores and coffee shops and supermarkets and office space and apartments. While the city requires them to build some affordable housing for not employees, it's not the majority. And the truth is, it doesn't really solve the problem. It just widens the gap between how tech workers and the rest of the people in the Bay Area live. But of course, just throwing money at the problem, throwing money at the tech workers, is obviously not a solution. On average, 16% of professionals in Silicon Valley have a psychologist or a mental health expert, far more than the national average. At the same time, there's been an increase in patients concerned about work-life balance, and of course, with due reason. Business Insider did this article where they infiltrated a social network company called Blind, where you only know the user's income and profession, nothing else. When I first joined, I found out that they called it graduation when they fired somebody. Hey everybody, just want you to know that Derek has graduated and we're all super excited to see what he's gonna do with his superpowers on his next big rock star adventure. Dude, you fired that guy, you know? And then you'd look over and you'd see like his desk is empty, his stuff is gone, and you didn't even know he was leaving because he never told anyone. And what they learned is that the recipe for success in Silicon Valley requires a significant life change. Here are some of the rules that blinkers, as they're called, follow. You have to study all the time in the bathroom, working out, eating, commuting, all the time. You don't want to cook, it's a waste of time. No video games, they're a waste of time. No sex, of course, a waste of time. And this is all for the hustle or just to make rent, as we've seen. And is this all worth it? 
I don't know, but the hustle tech workers are required to live up to is incredible and is exhausting. It was severe clinical depression, work-related only. It is hard to make it if you are not in tech here. You feel that alienation. Like you feel like people in tech are very supportive of you, but people that are not in tech sometimes can be a little bit um, dismissive. Like this rejection that you felt, is it because you work in tech or because you work in tech and are a foreigner? So when we actually moved here, we started living in the mission. So I was living this duality where a lot of people, you know, the mission district here in San Francisco is a Latino neighborhood. Um, so I had some people telling me like, you're a Latino, so you deserve to be here. But at the same time, I had people telling me, you're from tech, so you're just, you know, making it hard for everyone else to live here. In this tech world, not everybody can afford four walls and a roof. Silicon Valley might be home to Alphabet and Apple, but it's also home to over 400 RVs. You have workers of tech companies, these engineers with six digit salaries that just choose not to waste money on rent and, and live on RVs that they own. Exactly three days ago, I became a millionaire. I lived in this RV for three years in the middle of San Francisco, which has saved me $50,000 that's allowed me to buy an island in the middle of nowhere in Canada. So many of them. But not everybody in an RV is living this cool life. This street in Mountain View is filled with RVs on either side of the street, burning under the insane September heat. These are immigrant families, many undocumented that have no choice but to rent out one of these and squeeze in and just to be able to maintain a job in the Bay Area. A job that is just not enough to afford real walls or a roof. Growing number of RVs you see parked on Palo Alto streets are not owned by the people who live in them. A new kind of landlord pops up in the Bay Area. And of course, Locals don't like RVs or the families that come with them. Plenty of cities, including Mountain View, are constantly trying to forbid RVs from parking in their jurisdiction. And then, of course, you have people who can't even afford the RV. By 2019, there were 11,000 homeless people in Silicon Valley, which is an all-time high. And that's double what they had in 2011. And there's a good chance this count is way, way off. It's very difficult to keep track. The Tenderloin District in San Francisco is brutal. It's brutal because of the drug deals that we saw happening in broad daylight. It's brutal because it extends for blocks and blocks, but it's mostly brutal because it's here. It's the contrast. It's in the city that produces the device where you're watching this video, the website where you're streaming it. The challenges have severely worsened in the Golden State. It's not normal, the level of homelessness we have here. You can trace back the origins of the homeless crisis in San Francisco back to the 80s and even the 70s. The Reagan administration cut funding for a lot of public housing programs, which left the task of public housing to the local jurisdictions. And a lot of factories closed around that time and then better paid manufacturing jobs were replaced by jobs and services or blue collar work. The 70s also saw this historical milestone in how the US managed their mental health services called the deinstitutionalization movement. Thousands of mental hospitals funded by the government just stopped accepting patients or actively put them out on the street which is one of the biggest contributors to the homeless population, not only in San Francisco, but across all of the US. The 80s also saw the first conflict between activists who were trying to aid and feed the homeless population and developers or, or neighbors, just trying to stop this from happening around their parks or around their neighborhoods because nobody wants homeless people around where they live. The, the pressure was enough to get the city to arrest and cite both activists and homeless people in an effort to move them elsewhere. They call this criminalizing homelessness, mostly through this initiative called the Matrix Program. By the early 2000s, Mayor Willie Brown even instructed the use of helicopters with infrared cameras to identify homeless camps around Golden Gate Park and removing them immediately. San Francisco's municipal laws also allow officials to cite homeless people for affecting the quality of life of their surroundings. The city has gone as far as starting a program to fund the bus ticket for a homeless person to go to another city in the US with, with the purpose of sending them home. And this is a program that ran for years and it only ended six months ago after heavy criticism that they were just looking to dump their homeless population somewhere else. Today, the reality is the homeless population concentrates around the Tenderloin District possibly because of the number of social service agencies and nonprofit organizations that have their offices around there. And possibly because despite having the laws to do it, the police just can't or won't move their tents when they're in this district. Tenderloin is the 
painful reflection of how this, the richest state in the US, the state whose economy is bigger than entire developed countries, doesn't know how to solve their biggest problem, or just doesn't care. The contrast is too strong, the gaps are too big, and it's not getting better. I, I just don't know if any tech hub or any city that scales this fast is destined to create gaps like this. Probably not. We did see it in India for our previous Planet episode, and we just can't help but wonder if that's a price that these societies are paying for progress. Can anything be done here to motivate these bright, the brightest of brightest, to look beyond their MacBooks, to look beyond their startups, and to begin solving the problems that are just outside their doorstep, instead of trying to put them under the rug? Thanks a lot for watching.